foundation, the foundation of faith. Your heart for reset us. Oh, precious Lord, we adore you. There's a good worship that's given praise and love, Lord Jesus. We offer you honor and adoration. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our transgressions as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Bless her thou among women, praise the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for all sinners, now and hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and, and ever, ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Eternal Father, we offer you this moment, this time. We consecrate it to you. We ask you to take possession of every heart that are here to listen to this. Be with us. Let your Holy Spirit guide us unto the truth. We are here for you because we want to be like you. We want to be better human beings. We want to overcome the world. We are here because we love you. And we are here because we want to do your way. May your kingdom come in our hearts and in the heart of all men through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the most precious blood that pours out from the sacred head of our Lord Jesus Christ, the temple of divine wisdom, tabernacle of divine knowledge, and sunshine of heaven and earth, cover us now and forever through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So we are beginning today's conference from the purification of the memory. I recall that we began this journey with purification, the importance of purification. We went, we go as far as dividing, uh, trying to speak of the importance of purification, that purification is necessary for the perfection of souls and body to achieve perfect victory over the devil, over the world, and over the self. And this purification is of two types, perfect passive purification and active purification. That passive purification is that purification that God carries out in a soul with the approval of our will, and the active purification are those purification we carry on ourselves with the help of divine grace, such as fasting, mortification, pilgrimage, and so on. So the aim and the summary of the, the, the purpose of active purification is going to restrict the, the excesses of our external senses, because in the active purification, we have purification of the external senses and internal senses. So we're able to do a little summary and talk about the external senses and the internal senses. So today we are moving forward to talk about the purification of the internal senses, one of them that is called memory, because we were able to conclude that uh, common sense is controlled and purified by the custody and purification of external senses. And its mental power as one of the internal senses is purified and controlled 
when the imagination is beautified. So we concentrate on the memory and imagination. And the last meeting, we talked about imagination. And today we are moving forward to memory. Memory is very, very important because healing of the memory lane, what we store in our memory is even one of the tools that helps a soul for spiritual healing. Using centering prayer, we can heal our memories, the memory lane. We can actually forgive. We can actually heal the wounds that are stored in us. Before we come to know God, there's a lot of things we have stored in our memory that keep on haunting us. Most of them, after many years of our journey, they see pull us down. There are many monks who have stayed 10, 20 years in the monastery, but the memory of the past before they come into the monastery is still haunting them. Memory is one of those things that controls our forgiveness, how we feel, how we relate with, with a lot of people, and the joy we have in worshiping God. So memory is necessary to be purified in order to attain the perfection that God is calling us. So we are going to move into it. We have two types of memory, sense memory and intellectual memory. So we are going to begin with the sense memory. The mem those things that we, our senses, the five senses, as we know, we'll be able to store. Those things, these five senses can hold. And we have the object of this. These are the sensible things, things of the senses. And secondly, they are particular things, things that are individuated and then can be regarded as a particular thing. And the concrete things, things that we can actually concretize, not abstract, things that are concrete, like something that actually exists, that actually happened, that actually, and we can even equally even touch or feel, or, or just something that we can, we can bring closer to ourselves. So in sense memory, which is equally different from intellectual memory, which is abstract and the rest, Sense memory is something that is sensible, particular, and concrete. Let me give an example. When we have an experience, Recording an that is, someone has encountered an abuse. The experience is told in the sense memory. Because that experience, you know the person, the feeling is a sensible thing. So we know the person who have, have committed that act with us is a particular thing. So the circumstance is a concrete circumstance. So such action is one of those things that we can regard it as a sense of that is evidence of an abuse is a, of sense memory. So the question now is, what about intellectual memory? The object of intellectual memory is super sensible things, something that is a little bit above the senses, an abstract ideas, universal, something that contains universals. Let me give an example. The idea of knowledge, belief, custom, those things that you cannot touch, that the story that has been made or said about something and the belief we, we cannot hold, we cannot grab as a, as a sensible thing, something that is a little bit, a bit uh, above our sensible imagination. So such things is being stored in the intellectual memory. So, so when we study mathematics and ideas and abstract uh, subtractions and abstract uh, equations, 
All these ideas and this knowledge is stored in a intellectual memory, different from the sense memory of an experience or something that is sensible, particular, and concrete. The, these ones are being stored in the, in the super sensible, in the abstract, and the universal. So these three objects of intellectual memory is important for us to differentiate between sense memory and intellectual memory. But whether they are intellectual memory or sense memory, the purification is the same because what they do is that they store information, keep record of the track of what has happened many, many years ago. And the experience we have, we have undergone, the interaction, the encounter we have, all these things are being stored. And at times, if they are negative ones, they are haunting us and then making our way much, much difficult. So because the memory stores all, all kinds of knowledge, both good and bad, it is necessary to subject it to purification. So how do we do this? Method of purification of memory. The consideration here is something little, but great if you can apply it. The first one is attempting to forget our past sin, just like after one has been forgiven, has asked forgiveness and received forgiveness from the sacrament of reconciliation, ability to then forgive ourselves and then accept that forgiveness and let the past go. What that we what we mean by forgetting past sins and the past weakness. Very, very important. And then second one is seizing thinking of the past injuries, just like when forgiveness is actually happened, either we have forgiven or someone has forgiven us. Remembering that we have actually forgiven and stop counting the injuries of those wounds. Stop looking at the wound of that, of that, that will help to put this memory into proper purification. Then, remembering the benefits from God in the purification of memory, that is one of the reasons why we have to read the scripture. The, reading the scripture will help one to concentrate on the favor and the mercy of God. That God who created us, even when we are nothing, then redeemed us after we have fallen grievously, cannot abandon us. Now we are partially wounded with sin, or and that our, our the goodness in us is greater than our weakness. So we have to keep working and then keep remembering the benefits from God. If it is something like the the wound of unforgiveness or wounds of hurt, maybe by betrayal, by someone. Uh, treating you like an enemy, or by denial, or any forms of wound or hurt, then we can equally overcome them by the motive of Christian prayer, but motive of forgiveness, the journey of forgiveness, which we are going to treat on this different consideration. So considering the motive of Christian hope, for example, the thought of heaven, when we remember that here is not our home, it can help to filter and purify our memory, especially the difficult we normally have when we concentrate our mind and our heart as we have to say that heaven and everything, all our joy and hope is situated in the world. We are candidates of heaven. God will judge the world. There is going to be a, there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. The just will rise, while God will punish the unjust in the fire in the fire of hell. So after discovering this, our hope will be centered on something higher than this. So when our mind is highly elevated to the things of heaven, it's gradually brought about 
healing of the memory. And then there's one I have not put here. I mentioned what I call centered in prayer, contemplative centered in prayer. What does it mean? It means like taking time to concentrate on God, God's name, calling his name, concentrating and leaving ourselves empty to him, to walk into our memory lane and then begin to heal us. And what does it mean? It means at times take time in a day to concentrate on a one mantra prayer, just like name of Jesus, name of Mary, name of the saints, love of God, mercy of God, anything, just a very simple word you choose. Mercy, even if it's just this word, mercy, you call it, call it mercy and concentrate on it. If it's his name of Jesus, you keep on calling the name, concentrate on that, allow him to enter into you and walk the wonders of healing the memory way. There's something that is important here, which I want to say, when this purification is not, when the memory is not purified, there is a lot of problem we encounter in Christian faith. Our faith, forgiveness is difficult, our faith is in trouble, our happiness is equal, the joy we have as a child of God will equally be in trouble. So we keep on struggling with the past and then keep on suffering for what has happened in the past, even when God has actually forgiven us, or even when God has actually taken place, taken charge of the future of our lives. So the remembrance of eternity of happiness, which is the central object of Christian hope, is most apt of making us disdain the things of the earth and rouse our spirit to God. So it keeps us closer and then help us to think more of God and then concentrate more on the love of God. Let's move forward. So what I want to say on this, what I'm summarizing on the purification of the memory is very important that memory is necessary to be purified so that we can live concentrated, meditated, and then lovely, peaceful, peaceful life. A soul that is at peace with himself has actually healed Purified, has already forward the future of our, our life. So all those things are very necessary. And I would like us to take it another application that is of the passion. Passion is something that every man has. Apart from the memories and the sense, apart from the senses and external senses and internal senses. There is another aspect of ourselves that needed to be purified. And that is what we call the passion. So see how I defined it. I followed Thomas by saying that the sensitive appetite is the organic faculty through which we seek the good so far as it is known through the senses. That that makes us to seek anything that is good, that is the senses can see, the senses can perceive, can hear, can feel, is what we call the sensitive appetite. And this sensitive appetite is every organic man, organic animals, desire, even good, anything that is called animal, that has that desire seat based on their level. So there is another one called rational appetite which is uniquely for rational being. And it is distinct from the rational, the sensitive appetite is distinct from rational appetite. Or, or what we call the will, which is part of the intellectual appetite, which seek the good as apprehended by the intellect. There is another appetite that seek the good as long as the intellect or the will apprehend it. 
those ones are called the rational appetite. But the appetite of the senses is what we call the sense appetite. St. Paul will say that the flesh lusts after the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. The two are directly opposite. So just like the senses and the, the spirit seem to be in great battle on this. Type of sensitive appetite. The sensitive appetite also called sensuality is divided into two species. I would like you to see this in this category. We have two types of appetites, sense appetite and rational appetite. Let me just make a little bit reverse back. I talked about purification of passion. Before you talk about passion, you have to talk about appetite that propels the passion because passion is a movement of the appetite, of appetites, the energy of the appetite. So we have two types of appetites, sensitive appetites and rational appetites, which I explained briefly here. And we further say that sensitive appetites, which is also called sensuality, is divided into two species, concussible appetites, or you call it pleasure appetite, or irascible appetite, or you call it utility appetite. Now, the objects of concussible appetite has as each good, each object, or concussible appetite has as each object, the delightful good that is easy to obtain. For example, when you see a flower, it is the, and it is attractive. It is the concussible appetite, the pleasure appetite that will actually move you towards the flower, towards the flower. So that's delightful good that is easy to obtain becomes the, the first appetite that rises in every man. So that's that, that moves us into something derived from something good is what you call the concussible appetite. But there's another appetite that is that this object is the odious good that is difficult to obtain. So when you now move into going to oh, get that flower, imagine that flower becomes the rose flower and there is thorns around it to block it. The concussive appetite will seem to be slink, slinking. Another appetite will rise from within this concussive appetite, called the elastible appetite, that will tell you to move on, to forge ahead. So these two appetites move together. The movement of this sensitive appetite give rise to passion. So when the concussive appetite and elastible appetite propels a man, then the person have a passion. That, that thing that comes into, act, into action is what we call passion. We are going to explain it with many, many examples to make it a little bit understandable. So we can say that the passion is the movement of concussive appetite and irascible appetite. So we define it that the movement, the passion and the movement of the energies we can use for good or for evil, but in themselves, they are neither good nor evil. So passion is not good or evil, but it is becoming evil or good depending on where it takes us and the, the reason why we are doing it and what we are actually doing at that moment. The passion always presupposes some knowledge of the good that is sought for. Before any passion comes into a man, there is a knowledge of good that that passion is pursuing. Or the evil that is feared. Another thing that can bring about passion is that there is a knowledge of something that the passion is afraid of. Or the judgment. And the judgment made is always in terms of self. So when you are considering the beauty or the good, the judgment you are making to, that will carry the passion, they carry the, these two energies is always in terms of self. Self is being considered first. How to protect, how will I protect myself? 
what will myself gain what will i lose if i enter into this and all this makes move into what we call appetite uh, and what they call the appetite that propel this motion so that's why we say that the passions are by nature an expression of self-love anyone who is under emotion of passion is actually expressing his or her self-love so now let us trace some of the passions that can help us in struggling to become better how we can control and purify this passion. Because for us to go into purification of passion, we must identify those passions one after the other. So we, today we're going to try as much as we can to see the possibility of identifying some of these passions in man. So some passion comes from the sense appetite, that is the conspicuous appetite. Some people come from the irascible appetite. So let us consider the one that is coming from conquistable appetite first. In the conquistable appetite, we know that it seeks the delightful good that is easy to obtain. And we say the good which has a power of attraction engenders three, engenders three movements of passion. Any good that has power of attraction, let's concentrate like the flower is one of the good that has power of attraction. Okay, let us equally consider someone who is expecting marriage, want to get married, is a, is a good that is has power of attraction. We can equally consider, just like passing one's examination, is a good that is, uh, that is, that has power of attraction. So any good that has power of attraction produces or engenders three movements of passion. The first one, that the simple awareness of the good, just because of that good itself, it arouses love. For example, when one is considering the, the flower, seeing flower itself arouses love. Simple mind that hey, you have found your partner who we, you are get, going to get married, and then the person has actually accepted you. The simple awareness of that good that this person belongs to you as their own partner engenders love, produces love. That one has actually prepared the exam and then is about to, and he feel that when I get this, I will enter into another higher level of education. It is engenders love. The simple awareness of that good, not even having it, just simple awareness of it produces within a man the passion of love. If it is a question of future good, it gives rise to desire. If the marriage is prolonging, is very far away from us, there is desire. The passion of desire will rise. If that examination is still for them, we will be thinking, when will it come? That is what they call desire. If actually that good is, maybe the flower is very far reach from us, we cannot get it. It is still something that will take time for us to pluck. It engenders desire. It gives rise to desire. So now we have two passions. The one that comes by simple awareness of that good, which is love. The one which comes as it is a future good to be possessed, which is desire. If it is a good already possessed and present, it produces pleasure. So if, for instance, that you are able to reach your hand and get that flower, you already you are admiring it to experience pleasure. If that passion, if the marriage is already there and then you're already in, inside it, you are already experiencing the pleasure. If the exam has been achieved and you're already having the success, you experience pleasure. Using these three examples, so we have three passions 
which is neither good nor evil in themselves, that is produced from concursible appetite for the fact that the good has the power of attraction. These three passions comes into play. That is passion of love, passion of desire, and passion of <coughs> pleasure. On the other hand, the apprehension of evil, which is of itself repulsive. <coughs> For instance, there is something one sees as an evil, something that one is looking at, predicament coming, facing one. So knowledge of that evil, maybe at the time we are, uh, now we are facing pandemic, COVID pandemic. A lot of people just for the fact of remember it, uh, hearing that this word COVID is already evil on itself. It, it is repulsive. It produces hatred. You feel, hi, I don't belong this. If it is an impending evil, it causes a movement of flight or aversion. If such is a little bit something we can avoid, that is why some people will <coughs> decide to move to some other places, or it will, this flight can equally be you try to avoid it. But if the evil has overtaken us, it causes sadness. If eventually, for example, in the process of uh, doing everything, you have to be quarantined or you, you contacted, you have nothing but the sadness. It can equally be anything else. You have, you see someone who you love suffering, apprehending of the evil, you already hit. If it's something that you can make effort to avoid, you avoid. So, in conclusive appetite, when we apprehend, when it is good, is in question, we have three passion, love, desire, and pleasure. And when evil is under uh, the apprehension of evil, evil is in question, we have hatred, flight, and sadness. So, Hatred is equally a passion. Flight is a passion. Just like some people who, when some difficulties are coming their way and they feel like, if it is possible for me to avoid this, let me leave it, they can easily avoid it. There may be a difficult decision in life. What will I do? Can I avoid this? Can I make this? Some religious sisters and uh, uh, brothers at times when they are facing going towards their final profession they can easily experience this three type of passion depending on the or this six type of passion depending on the motivation on the state of mind one can see if he sees a lot of dangers on the way he can feel hatred if it's something that they can avoid they can say okay give me more time I, i'm not ready and if in the end of everything, if he cannot, that can be sadness. But if such a person is desiring it as good, that love, when will it come? And if he's desiring it, and then it is still far, it is yearning for it, desire. And if eventually it comes to pass, we see him or her rejoicing in happiness. This is about concussible appetites. So we have six passions within the concussive appetite, which is desire, look, which is love, desire, pleasure, hatred, flight, and sadness. Then let us turn to the irascible appetite. In the irascible appetite, the absence of good, if it is considered possible of attaining, and gender scope. Like something is difficult. Let, let's tell for ourselves about heaven, which is difficult. The journey of heaven is turning. The way is difficult and so hard. But it is possible to attain your scope. You have something you are doing. 
a difficult business you want to enter, difficult in such a way that I can, how can I, but it is possible, there is hope. Hope is a passion that comes from the irascible appetite, from the pleasure appetite. So we have to take note of that. But if it is impossible for attaining, it produces despair. So many people who are despairing is as a result of the irrational appetite. They look at the uh, difficult evil that is equally almost impossible to attain, to overcome. That's why they despair. It produces despair. Person feel hopelessness and that becomes despair because he cannot overcome this. The person cannot come out of this. So in like manner, the difficult evil that is absent, if it can be avoided, produces courage. For example, when there is another difficult thing in life that is a little bit uh, absent and that can be avoided, in one way, we have courage. Courage comes from the irascible appetite when one feels that I can avoid this, I can overcome this difficulty, then courage comes. Let me give an example. Uh, the one who is writing an exam and burning the candle studying hard is a, a little bit difficult. And he, this evil is a little bit absent in the sense that that person is actually seeing the difficulty in it and is passing through this difficulty. And then he can avoid this evil that becomes courage. But if the evil is unavoidable, it allows this fear that one must face it and must go through it. Fear comes in. And lastly, the presence of difficult evil produces anger in the irascible appetite and sadness in the conscious appetite. So what I would like you to take here is that anger comes from the irascible appetite, while sadness is a passion of the conscious appetite. Because sadness as presence of difficult evil, something that make you to be sad, you feel unhappy, bitterness in your heart, does not provoke you, provoke you into violence. So such a thing is rising from the conquistable appetite because this appetite is the appetite that seek good, seek the easy good to obtain. So when such a thing is a little bit not achieving it, the sadness comes in. But in irascible appetite, anytime there is anger, violent anger, it is that the irascible appetite is struggling to overcome the fear of the conquistable appetite. So here, it has to go through some struggle that is to help make one feel a little bit uh, a little bit violent over an over an issue. For example, irrational appetite can help as an anger can help someone who somebody is doing to bribery or to embezzlement of government funds, and the person still have Christian consciousness. That idea or suggestion can actually triple an anger in you. We can see it in Jesus, where Peter was telling him that you, you are not going to die, you are going to live in others. Christ, there is an electrical appetite that is being triggered. This passion of anger, Peter, Jesus had to say to Peter, get behind me, Satan, because you are an obstacle to the way of my father, to the will of my father. So it is a rational appetite. And that is why in this sense, this, either of this cannot be evil, but it becomes evil based on its use. For example, anger can help one to be able to 
overcome some evil, just like Jesus did, or fight against injustice, and so on and so forth. Sadness can make one be solo for his own sin. We have countries of hearts, have remorse, have recourse to himself and say, feel from feel a little bit repentant because the person is a little bit sad under the concrete appetite. The person feel a little bit. So you see that in sadness, it humbles us. It makes us feel bitter, feel within deep solo within us. But at times, anger becomes more external, more vocal, because it is a product of irascible appetites. In summary, the irascible appetite has five passions, hope, despair, courage, fear, and anger. Why the conclusive appetite has six passions? Love, desire, pleasure, hatred, aversion, and sadness. Now, what then do we need here in this journey of purification of this passion? The purification of this passion is important that we have to look into it in such a way that Whenever there is any of this passion rising in man, what we are going to look into is to discover the good aspects of this passion. Let the first for example, take for instance, love. It's a wonderful passion, which can actually tend to evil when it goes into the negative. So the purification here is to allow the light of grace to shine in this, to motivate these passions. Look at what I said here. I, saw, I put very close that. Passion diminishes human responsibility when a person seeks a good or evil more because of the impulse of the passion that by the free choice of the will, they increase human responsibility when the will conforms the antecedent movement of passion and uses it in order to work with greater intensity. So here, we now find out that when the will controls the passion, that is the reason, the intent control the passion, passion works perfectly. It takes one into the good aspect. So we purify the passion by subjecting it to the rule of reason. Principle of achieving control and proper use of passion. Now, this principle is important in a brief note, and after which I will just leave for today. Number one, that every idea tends to produce its corresponding acts. What does it mean that every passion must look towards its foundation, must look at the foundation of that passion? Because whatever arouses that passion will be what that passion will produce. For example, if somebody is angry, one asks himself, why am I angry? Then it is why you are angry that will help one to control the anger into the right way. At times, when we ask this question, we may discover that we are angry for nothing, and that can lead us to sin. If the anger is motivated by defense of good, it can equally be justified. But if the anger has no base, then it has to. So we need to consider that. Why am I angry? Why am I this? What is that? What's the root of this passion? What is the movement of this passion? And I could say that every act arouses the sentiment of which it is normal, of, of which it is a normal expression. That whatever we do out of our passion 
must equally postpone from the awareness or the sentiment that motivated that passion. And I equally say that passion augments and intensifies the psychological force of the individual and uses them for attaining the goal that one seeks. So when the passion moves us, that passion controls us if we are not make use of our senses. Every passion tends to move towards a particular direction to achieve what one is desiring or what one is seeking. If this one is searching after the good, passion takes you to good. And that is why we cannot talk about the passion of Christ that moves Christ into dying for humanity. He pursued the goal of saving man and his passion carries him all the way to Calvary and he died. The matters has their own passion. Passion for the sake of truth, standing for what they believe, dying for what they believe. So I want to uh, conclude it by saying that we have to regret our passion by firm resolution. Take time to read Silak 2, 1 to 10. If you want to serve God, you must prepare. Prepare and face the situation, whether good or bad. Situation that arouses passion, occasion of sin. Find out what motivates your passion, how is this passion being carried and moves up. The techniques of sub sublimation or transfer of trans or transferences, which I said here, will direct the energy of the passion to moral good and beneficial uh, objects. Just like in physics, they said that energy can neither be created or destroyed. Passion is an energy, it cannot be created or destroyed. When it arose in a man, you can only transfer it to something better to something good towards this positive action so that that passion may be able to, to be properly used. The energy will be properly used in something good. So here we stop for today and we pray and ask God to help us regret our passion, purifies our memory, and help us to attain the goal which he called us to do. May God, who is all knowledge and all wisdom, God, who is wisdom himself and knowledge himself, give us the light through his spirit to understand these words and live by them, all for the greater good of, of God, as Mama Maria prayed for us through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Precious Lord of Jesus Christ, save us yes. and the whole world. So that is where we are. So if you have questions, you ask. Yes. If I thought that any of you get what we are saying, you ask questions. If, if you don't ask, uh, you wait for me when we are going to ask you. <laughs> So, if you have questions, you can raise your hand. <coughs> Necessarily, we we'll pass these messages, this message to you as a member of Third Order for you to know, get to know them, whether you are understanding it deeply or not. Necessary. Because you should not say that you do not know a little thing about the need to purify one's passion. We are still immoral, 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 immoral theology or immorality. After this, we will still go to human development that will help us to handle our individual life, personal. So we are only talking about something related to our union with God and with others. So if you have questions, you, you can actually come up with your question. Brother Margavas. Okay. This is Magali. Hello. This is Magali. Okay, Magali, how are you? Good, and you, brother. Okay. Um, the question is quite complicated because the unconscious is 
um, a memory that keep the records of our life. And okay. so, and sometimes I pray that my unconscious be clean. And I ask uh, St. Joseph to help me to stay away from the unconscious. I understand the confession is important and cleans all the sins, but when it's dreaming, is there the unconscious coming and tell, tell or reminding what was the past? Uh, that's in my personal life. And um, in, the, in helping others, I found their unconscious also are um, very um, stern and they are making them very worry. So to help myself and to help others, I was thinking um, how the unconscious can be purified, like you say, I understand the prayer. And uh, is there any other ways that we can clean up our unconscious? Yes, another way which we are going to treat, maybe uh, after now, but maybe by next week, we discuss the importance of forgiveness in the purification of the memory and uh, in the preparation of the memory and consciousness. So next week, we are going to treat another important one. Most of the reason why many people find it difficult to clean their memory and purify their memory and their consciousness is because of the difficulty in grasping forgiveness. Forgiveness is of different ways. Forgiving God, forgiving oneself, forgiving the monsters, forgiving uh, even those who did not want our forgiveness. Forgiving our dead parents, our brothers, even the imaginary human beings we have not seen. So this importance of forgiveness, is this call for forgiveness is important. So when we forgive, we feel peace. Our memory is equally healed. We equally find peace when we forgive. But when we fail to forgive, our past keep haunting us. We keep living in the past instead of living in the pre in present. So by next week, we're going to do a little journey on forgiveness. The importance of forgiveness the need of forgiveness in the call of purification. So it is very, very important we pray about it. At times, it is difficult to heal the wounds, especially when those things are deep hidden in us. Most of us will suppress those ideas, thinking that it is no longer there. But at times, it will come up. At times, we begin to act without knowing what is actually going on. But if the idea or whatever is keep coming, the best way to handle the consciousness is to subject it to light, not to run away from it. Bring it up, face the reality of what that imagination is telling you or what the accusation that is coming up. Face that accusation, don't suppress it. Face it, then encounter that consciousness, that voice of the memory, bring it up, then and expose it. And that will help one to be able to make a sincere resolution to say, God, I am for you, or I need to heal my past. I need to amend what I have done that is not good. So you will heal the past. If there is need to go to people or some people and ask them to forgive you, you go. Because you cannot say forgive someone to forgive you when you have not actually uh, expressed what they will forgive you for. You must touch those things. So those acts, individual hurtings, 
you can discuss it with the person, I did this to you, I did that to you. That is even confession that heals the memory. Please forgive me, I cannot, uh, even if the person doesn't remember that, but you keep remembering it. You, you, you are, for you to heal the memory and all that, you have to go to the person, I plan evil against you, I block your way, I did this against you, I did that against you. The person will be saying that I didn't even know because the person is free, but you who is in, uh, who is under this horse is not even aware. Is you who are under this, the one who is suffering when the person whom you are hurting doesn't even know, can't even remember. So the person you hurt, is remembering or not, it doesn't matter because you are remembering it. It is yet to be healed. So one has to go and make a little move or say, forgive me, I did this for you, I that, I did this, please, I want to have peace. In this way, we can overcome the heal and purify the memory. And that will really be wonderful all for the greater good of God. Okay, thank you, Magali. Thank you. Any other question from any other person? We have a few minutes to go. Okay, I feel that no, no more question is coming. So by the grace of God, we will be there next week. Nothing will interrupt us. So, we will go further and gradually build up. Whatever you're able to capture in this lesson, take it and keep it. A time will come when it will become more clearer and clearer because we are going to be making reference to what we have said in different direction. And as we're explaining it all the more, it will be making more meaning. Remember that knowledge is power. We need to get this knowledge in order to help ourselves and help others who may need our help. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Eternal Father, I thank you for this wonderful day and the teaching you have given to us. We have talked about the memory and passion. We present our memory to you and beg you to heal the wounds of this memory. The memory of the past injuries, the past hurts, our past weaknesses, what we have done to ourselves, to others, to help and heal these wounds. Purify our passion. May these energies in us move towards your way in glorifying you, in doing your work. Let our food here on earth be to do the will of the one who called us who created us in his image and likeness. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you until we meet again next week. Thank you, and bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Support worship as giving praise and love, Lord Jesus. We offer you honor.